I'm so honored to be here today. Thank you to Harriet, who's just an incredible partner to EPN, and to all of you for joining today. Um, I thought I am Kathy Pope. As she said, I'm the development director for um, the Environmental Protection Network. I also am a community outreach manager for our uh, pro bono technical assistance program. So I just wanted to tell you very briefly about EPN. We are a network of 650 plus EPA alumni volunteers, most of whom spent decades at EPA. They worked as scientists, engineers, lawyers, economists, you name it. And now in their retirement, they're providing pro bono technical assistance to communities, the NGOs that represent them, and the state, local, tribal government agencies that serve those communities. So next slide, please, Michelle. So I wanted to tell you our pro, about a little bit about our pro bono technical assistance program. It is basically free consulting services and it is in support of community identified issues and goals. And so our staff and volunteers assist in navigating EPA, the federal bureaucracy of it all, <laughs> helping to understand regulations, programs and funding opportunities like the community change grants and the grant makers opportunities. Um, next slide, please. We have now 10 community outreach associates across the country. This is an old map. I'm sorry, I don't have an updated one yet because we just hired three, uh, three new staff members um, and our associates work closely with communities and they help facilitate the connections between our volunteers and community leaders to help with projects and seek out additional resources for communities. Um, and our, uh, our tech for technical assistance, including funding assistance. So if you ever need assistance uh, and think that an EPA alumni volunteer could be of, of assistance to you, uh, you can email us at info at environmentalprotectionnetwork.org, which I'll put in the chat a little bit later. You can be a, uh, then connected with an associate who works in your region. Okay, so I next, thank you, Michelle, next slide. I wanted to get right into the community change grants because I think this is the most pertinent information today and we'll hit the grant makers a little bit later. Um, the environmental, uh, the EPA Environmental and Climate Justice Program's Community Change Grants aims to support environmental and climate justice activities that benefit disadvantaged communities through projects that reduce pollution, that increase community climate resilience, and that build community capacity to respond to environmental and climate justice challenges. Next slide, please. Illicit drugs and guns around the world. Let's see. Sorry. Can you to me? Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So um, the, uh, where am I? Sorry. <laughs> um, so the objectives of this opportunity are focused on empowering and strengthening environmental and climate justice communities with resources, with partnerships, uh -huh and support to enable improvements in health, pollution, and the environment that will impact, impact these communities for generations to come. Next slide, please. So the majority of the objectives that you're seeing on these two slides apply to track one. Um, but specific to track two, I just wanted to call out is strengthening community part participation in government with the objective being for communities to have a voice and a seat at the table for decision-making processes that impact them. Next slide, please. So now I wanted to get into the eligible applicants for this opportunity. Um, eligible appli applicants include um, a partnership between two community-based nonprofit organizations or CBOs, um, or a partnership between a CBO and one of the following, a federally recognized tribe uh, or a local government, and this means any unit of government within a state. So for example, a county, a borough, a municipality, a parish, et cetera. Um, and then it could also be between a community-based organization and an institution of higher education. And this also inclu includes minority serving institutions. Now to qualify as a CBO, an organization must demonstrate that they are a nonprofit organization by including in their application some form of written documentation. And this can either be one, a written determination by the IRS that shows that you are exempt from taxation, or two, it can be a written determination by the state, territory, commonwealth, tribe, or other governmental entity within which the organization is located. 
In addition, the CBO also needs to have or demonstrate a relationship, or they can even be in the same geographic area as the disadvantaged community that, that, that excuse me, disadvantaged community that their project will benefit. And they need to demonstrate how that disadvantaged community or communities will benefit from their project. EPA for this opportunity is defining a disadvantaged community as one that meets at least one of the following criteria. Um, they can either be a, a geographically defined community identified as disadvantaged on the EPA IRA disadvantaged communities map. They can be a, uh, a farm worker community, which is comprised of individuals that don't have a fixed work address, um, who may travel from their permanent residence to work in agriculture. Um, it also could be a disadvantaged, unincorporated community. Um, an example of a community like this is a colonia. Um, next slide, please. So for this opportunity, there also must be what's called a statutory partnership. The statutory partnership is between two eligible entities, one of which, as we noted, must be a community-based organization. One of the partners is the lead applicant, and one is the statutory partner. Now, the CBO does not have to be the lead applicant. That's important to note. Um, but the lead applicant will be, um, must include in the application, this signed partnership agreement um, to be eligible for funding. And these, agree these partnership agreements do vary by state um, and they are legally binding. So if it's, if it's possible, it's, it's highly recommended to have a lawyer or a legal entity look over the, over the partnership agreement that you will be signing. Um, the lead applicant in the partnership um, also becomes the grantee to EPA, and they then operate as the pass-through entity for subawards to the statutory partner, as well as collaborating entities. And they will be responsible for then managing the grant. Um, in addition, strong applications are also going to include collaborating right. entities. Um, and this is in order to fulfill the proposal plans. So collaborating entities can be eligible or non-eligible entities. And these can include states, territorial governments, and international organizations. However, for profit firms or individual consultants or other commercial service providers cannot be collaborating entities, um, but they still can be included by being given a procurement award once the grant has been awarded. So it's important to understand that um, you have to follow EPA's procurement requirements, which basically means that the selection must be competitive among these non-eligible entities. And it's also important not to list a non-eligible entity that you would like to work with in your proposal. Next slide, please. So now I want to talk a little bit about the, the tracks. There, there are two tracks that you can go down for this particular opportunity. Track one is focused on really multifaceted applications with at least one project aligned with at least one climate action and one pollution reduction strategy, which will help meaningfully improve the environment, the climate, and the resilience conditions affecting disadvantaged communities. Um, these grants are very large. They're 10 to $20 million per award. And EPA is expecting to make approximately 150 track one awards. Next slide, please. So the track one projects, like I mentioned, have to include at least one climate action strategy and at least one pollution reduction strategy. So each climate action strategy is focused on building the short term and long term climate resilience. It's reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's providing additional co-benefits so that impacted communities can adapt to the changing climate. Climate action strategies, there are many listed in the NOFO. Um, it could include something like, for example, green infrastructure and nature-based solutions. So it could mean planting shade trees and restoring native plants. Um, additional strategies are things like microgrid installation, community resiliency hubs, et cetera. Um, pollution reduction strategies, can uh, an example would be for like um, 
outdoor air quality and community health improvements. So this could include something like funding the, the purchase, the upgrade, the maintenance of equipment and technologies that allows for um, inspecting, testing, monitoring, and sampling air pollution. Um, again, for both climate action and pollution strategies, applicants need to describe like relevant challenges faced in their proposed project area and how the strategies that they've selected will address those challenges. Um, and examples of all of these, like I said, are, are in the NOFO for climate action strategies. You can look in Appendix C for, for many examples and pollution reduction strategies can be found in Appendix D. There are another, a, a number of other requirements for track one, include, including a community engagement and collaborative governance plan. And it's required to help ensure that grant activities are driven and informed by the views of the project area community and are accomplished through collaboration among the key stakeholders. Um, and also a community strength plan uh, should include strategies for how the project will promote inclusive economic development and drive be benefits of the projects to existing residents. The readiness approach is a description of how applicants will initiate a grant upon the award so that they can stay within the three year limit. This um, projects that are uh, granted through this opportunity must be completed within three years. And a compliance plan to ensure that compliance with government regulations are met, for example, fi financial management. Um, and then also just to note that applicants for track one who score well in their written application will then also have the opportunity to do an oral presentation where they can share information about the community oriented nature of their project and how they'll successfully implement the grant. Next slide, please. Um, track two applications really focus on breaking down systemic barriers to community participation in government processes, um, impacting environmental and climate justice. So this could be done by creating engagement and feedback mechanisms between community members and government decision makers. Um, infected projects should also involve partnerships um, between community organizations, between with government, with philanthropic organizations, et cetera, um, who can support the collaboration across sectors to really facilitate this engagement of disadvantaged communities in governmental decision-making processes. These awards are, are a bit smaller. They're from one to three million per award. EPA is expecting to make approximately 20 track two awards. And just to give you a, a quick example of this type of project, although there are many in the NOFO, um, it could be, for example, an educational and training program to help prepare, train, and educate members of disadvantaged communities on how to engage in government processes related to environmental and climate justice activities. Next slide, please. So there are a few limitations on the uh, opportunity. Um, lead applicants may submit a maximum of two applications and can receive up to two awards. So the two applications could be two track one applications or two track two applications or one of each. But if you submit more than two, you will be asked to withdraw, withdraw your uh, extra applications. Next slide, please. Um, EPA is also granting these uh, funds on a rolling basis. But if you are ready and able to submit early, you could be eligible for early review and award. And then if you aren't funded initially, you could actually potentially resubmit an application after a debriefing with the agency to see how to strengthen your proposal. So the final deadline for this opportunity is actually all the way in, in uh, November 21 of 2024. But um, there is no, there. That is if funds remain. So we really do encourage applicants, if you are interested in applying, uh, to do so as early as possible. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I just wanted to provide some of the EPN resources that we have for this opportunity and others. Um, we do send out uh, sort of bi-monthly bi a federal funding update, which will give you new resources for current funding opportunities like the change grants, as well as alerts about new opportunities. We've also created a six step application process for the community change grants for both track one and track two. And they have project narrative templates, uh, a sample project narrative for track one, 
uh, templates and samples for attachments and other resources. And we're going to continue adding resources to these as we can. We're going to have soon an oral presentation sample as well as a track two project narrative sample. Um, we also, uh, the community change grants, we have a partner and assistance survey. So if you're interested and you need partners, you can fill this out and look for uh, other um, entities in your area that you might potentially be able to partner with. In addition, um, we provide SAM.gov registration office hours every Wednesday, uh, every other Wednesday, Wednesday excuse me, from uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. And so if you aren't registered yet, or if you're having trouble along the way, we're happy to work with you at any point to help get you over the finish line. And then of course we do offer one-on-one -on -one support to help brainstorm proposal ideas, to potentially review proposal drafts. Um, and if you ever need assistance, you can, as I mentioned, uh, email info at environmentalprotectionnetwork.org to request assistance. So um, I'm gonna turn things over. Uh, as uh, Harriet mentioned in the beginning, um, EPA is providing a great deal of technical assistance for this opportunity. And today we're really fortunate to have um, Garrett Russo from Indina to tell you more about the community change technical assistance, as well as Abby Hall, who will be providing information on the community change equitable resilience technical assistance, which is for communities in disaster prone areas. So, mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. I have a couple of slides of my own, so you're going to uh, soon not see my face, hopefully, and that's for the better for everyone. Um, so let's see here. Can and everybody see these? Oh. Okay. Slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Okay. First off, again, thank you for having me. Uh, as Kathy said, I am Garrett Russo. I work with Indyna. We are the lead technical assistance provider for the EPA. We are a contractor. Uh, I am not an EPA employee, uh, and I don't play one on TV. So we are ones that are out there uh, helping to get the technical assistance for the folks that, that need it uh, to, to get their grants from an idea to the finish line. Uh, there's a couple of things before moving forward with what I wanted to talk about that I just wanted to echo uh, on what Kathy had said. First off, again, uh, there's roughly $2 billion that the EPA is looking to hand out really before Halloween is what they're really trying to get it out, out the door by. Um, so, And once that money is gone, it is gone. That doesn't mean you need to be hasty with your application, but the sooner that you can get it in, the sooner, there's not like, a, they're, they're, they're reviewing applications on a rolling deadline. So the sooner you get it in, the better chance you have, because when the pot of money is, is exhausted, no matter how great your idea is, uh, if the money is gone, you're gonna get a no. So thinking about it now, and we can talk about the technical assistance that Indyna can provide to help you get from that idea phase, write all them down um, to, uh, to, to submission and, and, and hopefully a yes from EPA. Uh, secondly, uh, Kathy, you mentioned SAM.gov, and SAM.gov is you need a SAM account to apply for a community change grant or, quite frankly, any government grant. So Kathy offers a fantastic resource helping uh, everybody get over the finish line of getting that SAM account up and running. But the, the ultimate application needs to go through grants.gov. So once you have a SAM account and once you have your application ready to assist, to, to also need an account on grants.gov to submit your application. Um, this is something that has nothing to do with the EPA or nothing to do with Indyna. It's a different organ of the federal government. And, and quite frankly, it takes a while. So if you don't have an account on, on grants.gov, it's to get it um, get it up and running. So that's something that you want to be working with in parallel to make sure that you have a grants.gov account um, ready to go when your application is ready to go. Um, again, I talked about what we uh, what our role is. We are the technical persistence providers, and we're and we're really here to help get you guys across the finish line. One of the biggest resources that we have for technical assistance is that we've built a website out for specifically for this. This is a bit of an old screen uh, screenshot. By old, I mean about a week and a half or two weeks old. Um, 
But if you go to communitychange2ta.org, we're building this out to be a really a one-stop shop for information on how you can get technical assistance, how you can sign up for technical assistance, and the types of things that we can provide. We are also providing for the next four weeks, maybe five weeks, I believe, weekly webinars on specific topics related to the community change grants. Yesterday's webinar, we did either every Tuesday at 3 p.m. in the afternoon Eastern. Um, yesterday's webinar was, was how do you define if you're a, a, a disadvantaged community or not? That webinar will be up with both the slides and the, the YouTube link that you can watch. That will be up uh, within the next couple of hours so that you can watch it. The next week's webinar is all about track one. So we're going to dive really deep into what track one means and all those different uh, uh, parts that you need to go through for track one. So I would encourage you to come to TA, communitychangeta.org, sign up for the webinar, sign up for email, uh, and, and really join us in becoming part of the community. You also see on this page, there's a big button that says technical assistance uh, on it. If you're interested in technical assistance, again, it is free or it is taxpayer funded. It doesn't cost you a dime. Please just come to the website, uh, click on that technical assistance, and there's a form that you just have to fill out. Uh, it's you know it's not its name address what, what kind of project you want all those sorts of things and send it to us we have people that are standing by right here i'm based in arlington dc arlington virginia washington dc area uh, that review this right when it comes in the door and we'll get back to you within a matter of you know 42 72 40 48 72 hours to try to start the process of hey is is the project eligible and those sorts of things um this is again more of the website i'm gonna uh, skip through that so an overview of what we can do on technical assistance. Again, the EPA provided a lot of money, $200 million or so, for technical assistance. They do not want the question of how do I do this or, or gee, this looks complicated, um, to be a barrier to getting transformative, uh, transformative funds to the communities that need them most. That's not going to be the barrier. That's what Indina is here for. We want to get you guys in the door. Look, applying for a federal grant is tricky, particularly one that is large, $10, $20 million. It is not an easy hoop to go through, and we have experts across the board that can help hold your hand. Um, it, any, all the grants need to go to disadvantaged communities. The EPA, however, has been very specific that there are five communities that they are really kind of putting a, a spotlight on. Uh, one is, is tribal communities. The second is Alaskan tribal communities. The third is territories. Uh, the fourth is within 100 kilometers of the southern border. And again, kilometers, not miles, which is a little bit weird for the federal government. But again, kilometers, not miles from the southern border. And then the fifth Fifth one is those disadvantaged unincorporated communities, the ducks, as, as Kathy called them. Those are the five target areas that they're really looking after. But any uh, disadvantaged community is eligible to both receive a grant and receive technical assistance. So we have everything, pre-award. We can help you design a project, prepare an application. We can do facilitate partnerships. Really everything that we can do, everything to help you get your application from an idea to the finish line, except put pen to paper. We cannot write your application for you. If you need engineering assistance, we can have that. If you need budget, you know, how do I build a budget? We can. We have experts that we can provide to you. We have a, a, a it's not great to make uh, military references, but we have an army of technical assistance providers that we are building out right now. Some in those, those targeted communities, but all, all across the country so that we are able to provide one-on-one -on -one or small group support to get you guys from idea to submission as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. So what this looks like, right? Like I said, you come to the website, you sign up, you fill out the form for the the, the, the TA requests, right? I, I want technical assistance. We look at the eligibility, right? Some, some things we're gonna be able to, to kind of just quite frankly, kick out right off the bat. I'm sorry, or anything like that. Um, so we're able to get back to you within a couple of hours, day, two day, three days or so, and say, I'm sorry, this project just, just as it is, just doesn't meet the criteria for it for this grant. Here are some ways that you can maybe change it um, or whatever the case might be. But then 
we'll we'll do that eligibility review straight off. So we're not going to string you along or anything like that. We're going to try to get you uh, an answer as quick as we can. Once you pass that eligibility review, then we sit down and we talk about what you need, right? The uh, technical assistance team uh, and, and you guys on the ground. What do you need? Like I said, do you need engineering? Do you need budgetary procurement? You, the, the, the list is, is nearly exhaustive. If you need it, we can provide it is, is really almost what it comes down to. And once we get that, we will then assign you to a lead technical assistance provider, someone who we, we go call by LTP, someone that's going to be your best friend over the next couple of months that's going to help get you through the, to the finish line. Um, so when you request for technical assistance, again, I'd say go back to the, the website, community change or slash technical assistance. There's a big gigantic button on the on the upper right of the website. These are the things you're going to have to find out. Content, contact information, type of organization. Um, I, I, you guys can read. I'm not going to uh, rip through all those things. Eight, eight pieces of information should take you less than five minutes to apply. If you have questions, we have a 1-800 number that is set up that is manned that you can call, ask questions, 800-540-8123, or you can send us an email, ejtechassist at epa.gov. Any and all ways to get in touch with us to, to really start that technical assistance process moving forward. Um, what the eligibility review is. I think we already talked about this. You know, is is there a CBO? You do do remember your organization has to do. Uh, there has to be a partner. It just can't be you. It's community-based organizations. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, that is a a five hundred one c three, a nonprofit. But there are some other um, different organizations that can check that box. If you have a question, give us a shout. Out. Um, there has to be at least one, and I, I tend to say, think of this like an email, right? On the two line of the email, there has to be at least one CBO and one of the following below, a local government, a tribe, an institute of higher learning, uh, et cetera. There has to be one of each of those. There could be two CBOs, but there cannot be two local governments, two tribes, two institutes of higher learning. There has to be at least one CBO on the two line. Um, there can be, so, and, and as Kathy mentioned, you can only apply for two, one track one, one track two, two and track one, one, 10 to $20 million a piece. You also, they're, they're 10 to $20 million a piece. So you, um, you can't ask for 30 in one and 10 in the other, right? So it has mm. to be 10 to 20 for each of them, right? How can we help you do the needs assessment? You have your direct contact. I've talked about a lot about this, but we're going to drill down a little bit more. Brief conversation, and then we're going to match you, you, right, with your TA request. Uh, some of those are going to be by geographic location, right? We, we, If you're 100 miles, for example, we have a, a, a lead technical assistance provider in LTP um, who's up in Alaska. So if you're an Alaskan tribe, uh, you know, he can come to you, right? You can go and he'll talk to you anywhere in the state. It's a pretty big state. Um, so it's it's helpful that he he's on the ground. He knows the he knows the communities and all those sorts of things, as opposed to, excuse me, uh, talking with an LTP who's in Vermont, right, who might not necessarily have the expertise on Alaskan tribes. Similar thing, we have somebody on the on border communities and, and moving on like that. Um, we'll also be able to match you up with with similar projects, right? So one LTP is going to be handling you know, energy projects, and and, and you know they they come with with various different expertise. These aren't people off the street. These are honest to god experts on how to get this stuff done uh, moving forward. Once you got that LTP, individual level contact, one on one, and and really. Uh, making sure that they're your uh, they provide a uh, a conduit to other subject matter experts, right? I'll, I'll I'll go back to the 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 guy we have in Alaska, right? He knows the tribes. He can help you get there. Um, but once once we're starting to do the project assessment, and, and it turns out that you need engineering help, for example, uh, well, he's not an engineer, but we can put you in touch with an engineer. Again, free of charge, doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to pay the engineer, um, but we can play that matchmaking. Making, uh, through that to make sure that you get the help that you need. Um, and then uh, specific support, you know, are you ready? Compliance plans, all, yes. all these sorts of things. Uh, go ahead, was there, uh, uh, all, is all available. 
Um, the litany of right, all these things that we can provide. I talked about them again. They're on our website. I, I'm not going to read a, a, a slide that has a hundred words on it. Uh, we'll share this. I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. Um, and that's all I've got. So I, I'll stop there. I think I'm handing it back to Kathy, right? Or, um, Kathy, um, and and happy to take questions later in the the conversation. So thank you again for. For listening. Thank you. Kathy, are you here? I am here. I think we were going to pass it over to Abby to give okay. her an opportunity to speak, right? Good. All right, my turn. Hi, everybody. Good to see so many great groups here. Recognize several names. Um, so this is good that I'm going next right after Garrett, because this is like the smaller TA program, we call it. Um, it's, it's more defined. So the name is confusingly very similar, but you'll notice in the middle, the terms equitable resilience. So let's just call it that. This is the equitable resilience technical assistance. And I include this beautiful image in the background because this is the type of design work that we intend to do through this program or an example of the type that we could do based on a project we did um, last year with the Fort Peck tribes in Northeastern Montana, um, designing a park on um, what is currently a waste transfer station, basically a dump um, next to the Missouri River. Um, and we worked with the tribe to design um, how that space could be reused. So what is this? This equitable resilience program is intended for disaster prone and disadvantaged communities. So you've already heard a lot of definitions about disadvantage. We use the same ones. We use that IRA map that I put in the chat, um, but we're also looking to provide assistance to those communities that are disaster prone. Um, and I have in the chat ready to go. I'm going to put a link to our webpage where you can find all this information about this equitable resilience program. Um, we have a few different tools we're using to figure out if community locations are disaster prone. Um, you'll see those different tools listed on the webpage. And one of the options is you just tell us, you just tell us why you believe you're disaster prone. So we've, we've tried to provide some available tools and make it easy, but also want you to be able to tell us in your own terms. So this is design assistance. It's place-based, very site-specific design assistance, as well as community engagement support and partnership development that result in a climate resilience project that's eligible for the community change grant. So when Kathy talked about the track one projects um, under the community change grant, um, and there's a climate action strategies, you can think of this assistance as really predominantly focused on that piece, though we're not gonna ignore the rest of what you would wanna put together in a track one application, um, but it's really, it's called equitable resilience. We're looking at climate resilience projects. And that's, you know, for example, a focus on new or expanded green infrastructure and retrofits of existing community infrastructure and open spaces. I'll talk in a second, I'll show you a slide with some project type examples. So the goal is to help address impacts from heat islands, extreme heat, wildfires, wildfire smoke, floods, storms, or other climate impacts mm -hmm. that pose a greater risk to disadvantaged communities. So one way to think about this is we're really interested in designing projects that are protecting people from climate impacts and really thinking about that public health nexus. So we have funding to do up to 50 projects um, and we're on the same timeline looking at that November 21st, 2024 date when the um, notice of funding opportunity closes. Um, so we're hoping to provide this assistance as soon as possible so that um, the recipients have time to get the final products and turn it around and write your own grant application. So what does the process look like? It's a pretty quick turnaround, four to five months from start to finish. Um, once we receive requests, determine a good fit for the program, we'll have an initial call to identify what your community assets are, what your challenges, interests, what your existing or hopeful community engagement strategies are. And then very quickly, like with, you know, the call happens within two weeks, the site visit happens within about a month um, of when we kind of make contact. We like to get our teams on the ground, 
I find that it's really helpful to do these in-person site visits so we can meet people, understand your community, understand what you need, and also walk and see the actual sites that our consultant teams will be de designing for. And so we have uh, one to three sites um, that our design teams um, can develop designs for. After that site visit, that team goes back and develops the design, does ongoing community engagement work, and then it develops initial concepts, helps you figure out supportive partnerships, and then comes back for a second one day site visit that's an on-site design workshop. And that's where you kind of bring people in. It's a fun process. People get to look at images and sit around maps together. And at that design work workshop, um, we'll confirm and select the final designs. And then the team will wrap that all together with a final set of design options with a preliminary budget and a project summary for the whole process that the technical assistance recipient can then use in developing and writing your own grant proposal. Um, and then the consultant team is, can, is sort of on call after that final deliverable gets handed over to provide additional support as needed to troubleshoot all the other pieces of grant submission um, that we've heard about that Indina or EPN can also offer. So the project types, these are just some examples and they reflect some of the um, climate action strategies and pollution reduction strategies you'll see in the NOFO. So we're looking at community serving buildings that might be um, schools, um, recreation centers, um, spaces that are owned by a CBO that serve the community, um, thinking about like creating resilience hubs. We're also looking at public parks and open space, um, transportation and mobility that might be retrofits to streets and, and upgrading um, streetscapes. And then there may be other project types that are outlined in the NOFO that are eligible that your community needs help with. And, and those could be a fit as well. Um, sort of we have to make sure they match within the confines of what our consultant team set up to do. So um, if you go to that website, uh, you'll see there's a link on there and I can put a direct link to the request form as well. But these are essentially the questions that we're asking in that request form. Same as in Dyna, do you intend to and are you eligible to apply for a community change grant? Two, do you agree to host EPA's contractors for these site visits? And then we ask um, for some information about the actual addresses and locations of your one to three sites. Um, and that helps us determine that disaster prone status as well. Four is describe the site. Do you know who owns it? Has there been any environmental assessment? Is there any land use information? Anything you can tell us about that site and, and what's going on with it now? Five is explaining the potential resilience benefits for disadvantaged communities. And then six, engagement plans. Like who are your partners now? How are you already working in the community? And that, that gives our team a good sense of um, sort of the status and what you might need um, in regards to building out your partnerships. So this um, program opened the same day that the grant opened back in November of 2023. We're also on a rolling um, basis of accepting requests and assigning those out to our contractor teams as they come in. Um, so we have 50 slots. It's essentially first come first serve. We do expect and hope that most of this technical assistance will be delivered in the first half of this year. So, you know, we're in February now, um, I, you know, based on the timeline of when the NOFO closes and how long it takes us to do this whole process, uh, projects need to start no later than July in order for us to wrap it up, hand over the final deliverables in time for um, anybody to submit a, an application by that November 21st, 2024 deadline. So here's, and, and I can put these in the chat. Um, I already put the, the top link to the, to the Equitable Resilience Program. If you have any questions, you can email equitableresilience at epa.gov. We check that every day. And then if this sounds like the right assistance, um, I can put this also in the chat, but there's a direct link to submit a request there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Abby, Gary, and uh, Kathy, I'm, I, I particularly want Abby. You know, I, we've been running Anthropocene Alliance for, I don't know, since 2017. And this is the kind of technical assistance I think people have dreamt of. It's, well, it's frustrating that it's so rushed and everything. And I know that that's not uh, EPA's fault. It's it's politics at play there, but it really is tremendous. It really is fantastic. And, you know, as you will know, because we've been in contact, I've been connecting 
you know, various A2 members to the Equitable Resilience Technical Assistance, and it's been outstanding. Um, so thank you, and please pass that message up. Um, and I, I think I have felt from other people, I didn't know so much, uh, uh, Garrett, about the other technical assistance, and I, it's very impressive. Um, so, you know, thank you for all of that. Um, I so I guess I've got one one immediate question, and I'm sure that people so people if you could use the reactions just because you're on various screens for me. So if you could use the reactions thing, I think that's the best way of putting your hand up. Uh, that's the best way of taking um, uh, uh, questions. Um, I've got one quick question around, and I think I asked this to you before, Abby, but if you could just sort of re-answer around people who want to apply for both um, or have been accepted into one and can they apply for the other? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Ideally, you get one or the other. Um, we're sort of trying to avoid a, a double dipping. And if, if, if we can support you, then we try to pr provide all of the support you'll need through the Equitable Resilience TA if you've got really site-specific design needs. Um, and if we get a request that we feel like it's not quite a fit for one of the reasons, we're doing a direct referral to Indina. So we're also trying to say like, if we have all your information you already submitted once through our request form, we're not gonna make you resubmit it again for a second form. I'm gonna take your form and I'm gonna email Garrett's team and say, we've, and we'll, we'll call. We, we've learned just like helps a lot to have a conversation, sometimes talk these things through because it's confusing. They all sound the same. <laughs> How do you decide one or the other? So we've been trying to pick up the phone and just have those conversations when it's like, I think what you need is probably the broader community change technical assistance, and then we'll hand you right over to Garrett's team, share the information that we got from the request form so that they have that in hand and save you a step as, as best we can. Now, I'm sure we're not doing a 100% great job, but we're really, really trying to do the best we can on just referring you to the right, to the right type of technical assistance. And then honestly, I'll say we've seen some requests come in where people don't really intend to apply for a community change grant, but they do have projects and they need support. And then we're trying to connect you directly to your tick tax. And you probably know about those thriving community, thriving community technical assistance networks. And there's, uh, I can put a link to that. That's a whole other thing um, that's invested in by our EPA's Office of Environmental Justice. That's bigger than this one grant opportunity. It's broader capacity building, trying to do a better job at EPA, reaching out to community groups that we have failed to support and reach out to in the past. And so I've talked to a few people who are like, whoa, I don't need a 10 to $20 million grant, but we do have all these other needs. In those cases, we're trying to put you in touch with the Tic Tac and our in our regional offices where we have people who are excited and ready to help with some of the broader issues you might face. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And I'm gonna pass everyone, um, I'm gonna go over to Mike Burns before I, I'll get you to speak, Mike. I just want to say many, many A2 members have benefited from the incredible help of C2P2 led by Michael Burns. Um, uh, so thank you, Mike, and over to you. I don't know if it's a question or a, because I, I know that you are providing services yourselves through the TA program. Well, thank you for the kind of words, Harriet. Um, one, a couple things. It, it, my understanding was there was $150 million in a community change grant program that was specifically dedicated towards Alaskan tribes. I didn't hear that mentioned, but I just wanted to ver you know, verify that that was indeed the case. <clears throat> and the question was, What's the difference, Abby, between what you do and what Garrett does? Because, you know, I'm really familiar with what Andina does, but I had no clue what you were doing. And it kind of sounded the same. So if I'm a community, how do I know which one to apply for? And what's the difference between the two different uh, programs? Um, I'll answer. And maybe Garrett will have some thing to add, too. Ours is design assistance and ours is really on site. We come to your community twice with a team of consultants who meet with you, walk your site and really develop specific design images. Now in Dynamate, sounds like they do some design and engineering support as well, um, but uh, I don't think they ever come on site. There's no travel component. So I think that's one really big piece. Um, and the design could be, you know, we have some communities that are like, We've done all these studies, we've had all of these alternative analyses provided to us, but we have never kind of pulled it together into a clear grant ready 
project proposal. That's where I think we can add value. And there's also some that's like, well, we don't know. We have all the, we have five different sites in our community. We don't know which one to pick, which one's a good fit for the grant and how we would take our vision in our minds and put it on paper. That's the other thing our um, consultant teams are ready to help with through equitable resilience is that first site visit for several of the communities we're working in now is helping them pick the right site and pick the right project uh, for uh, the community change grant. But Garrett, I don't know if you wanna add anything about what you think the the, the real difference is. Now the last is ours is for really disaster prone communities. So that piece, you know, if, if, if you're just facing challenges with being next door to polluting industries, but you're not really struggling with flood impacts or, you know, wildfire smoke, that's not really in the mix, then equitable resilience is probably not the right fit. So yeah, I think I think that's the the key one uh, to your first question, and Kathy answered in the chat. Yeah, it's about 150 million dollars for for Alaskan tribes. Um, second, uh, we we I mean we provide whatever you need, right? We're gonna have for our technical assistance will be one on one help, and you know that could be via teams, and that could be that can be, and we're gonna we, we got people on the ground, so we will travel. Uh, you know, <clears throat> if, you know we, we've got the money to do it. We can travel as needed. So it's um, it, it 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 really depends on the um, on the situation, right? Um, I, again, I, I go back to our, our guy in Alaska, right? We have him on the ground. He will be there. He's gonna be you know shaking hands. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you need engineering help, um, you know. Are the engineers necessarily going to come um, to your site um, if they have to? Maybe. Um, so it, it, that that there's much more on on an ad uh, kind of an as needed basis. Uh, I think the other differentiation and 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 um, I, I'll point out here that that um, I think the, the the community change grants are are a little more. Um, God, what's the word I'm looking for? um mega uh for want of a better you know the these things we're talking 10 and 20 million dollar projects so that that are that are just these are just huge different things um so that's when where we're passing off with uh epa and whatnot if does that answer your question it does and, and just one other thing real quick harriet that wasn't mentioned one of the advantages of getting your application in early is that if you don't get it they'll send you back comments and you have the opportunity to reapply. I mean, I didn't hear that mentioned, but that's kind of a big deal because I've never yeah, heard of a, I, I, I've I think, never heard of a government program where you could resubmit. So that's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kathy mentioned that, but yeah, it's definitely worth re-mentioning as well. Um, they, they, they score you. And I think you have to get to like a hundred and I don't know off the top of my head, like 140 points or something like that for, for track one um, projects to, to get you to orals. And then there's a, a point structure that you have to get there. Um, but yes, they will give you feedback and say, this is where you're short. Um, and, you know, if you can fix X, Y, and Z, bring it back to us. Um, and yeah, I've, I've never heard of that in a government program either. It's, it's, it's uh, so, but again, they really want the, 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 the data is is november 21st but they really want the money out the door by by halloween so um you know if you don't get your application in in august and they say you know here's a you know here's the edits we want to see you know you've, you've got a really short turnaround time and and, and the money might be gone so I, I, what i tell people is is always um there is no need to be hasty right you want to send in a, the best application that you possibly can um you know so don't yeah you, know, you couldn't do it tomorrow anyway but i mean don't rush something in tomorrow but um you know every day counts and the sooner you're in the sooner you uh the the, the more money's in the pot um and the and the the, the longer you have to, to turn around edits Thank you. Thank you. I can see we're going to run out of time for questions, but we'll just work through as many as we can. And I'm just going through in order. So Aaron, I think you were the next. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, my main question is whether all of these, these grants need to be awarded to single site specific projects. Our project is aimed at distributing indoor pollution reduction measures into the homes of the lowest income people in our community. And so we, we're not gonna have a single site that's gonna be, we're gonna be getting into as many homes offering residents as, 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 as much as we can. And often these will be tenants. 
So that's that's my question. So I think either either Garrett or Kathy for that. I'm probably correct, Abby, that that's not so relevant in your case. Do, right. Do... I'll, I'll just jump in. It does not have to be just for one site. I mean, it can it can it can benefit different disadvantaged communities. If this is a track one application, you do need to provide uh, um, a proposal area map. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> I would say check out Indina's uh, webinar that they just did yesterday. It goes into in depth about this, but within the outline of this map, it does need to show the disadvantaged communities that you are proposing yep. to, uh, to help with your proposal, but it does not just have to be one site. Yeah, echoing that, and again, that webinar will be up. Um, it's two o'clock on the East Coast. It'll be it'll be up before it'll be up before I leave the office today. Let's 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 put it like that. Happy so, go go that route. Um, Queen Shabazz. Thanks. Good good Wednesday, everyone. Yes, and also during yesterday's, um, we we they actually went through the EJ screen to show us how to do the mapping. So that was very helpful. My question, I guess, is for Garrett. An organization, we've been approved for Community Change Grant, um, TA. I had my first call on Monday, but the person that I was assigned to is in, in Georgia. We are in Virginia. So the question is, would would our person tap be local or in the same region with us? And also, she wasn't aware that we had been approved. She She thought it was just an intake. So that was kind of concerning. She wasn't aware that we had already been approved for the technical um, assistance. Sure, I, 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 I can't speak to that. You know, specific instance. Um, the you're in you're 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 in Virginia. She's in Georgia. It was the other way around, right? You're you're in. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um, um, so technical assistance can happen in, in multiple ways, right? Sometimes you, the, the being in the neighborhoods helps. Sometimes it's your project is, is you know, her expertise, right? Um, so I, I can't necessarily speak to, to that specific instance. I'm sorry. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't, I really don't have an answer to that. Uh, that, that person is going to be, um, your LTP, um, and, and, you know, uh, you know, first dates are hard sometimes. Right. Um, but we, we, we get better. Right. Um, so, uh, that, that's about all I can say on that front. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> sure. You. Andrea. Uh, you're on mute if you're speaking. Andrea? No, okay. Um, hi, oh. hi, hi, sorry, hey. sorry. My battery was going, so I had to plug back in, uh, charge uh, the computer, my apologies. Um, so I kind of have two questions, I'm a bit confused. We have the EPA technical assistance grant that was initially sent out, A2 sent it out. And now is, and Dinah, you subcontracted on the EPA. So you have a separate, uh, technical assistant uh, form to be filled out uh, that's separate from the EPA technical assistance grant. And I guess the reason I'm uh, saying that is... Me, right? Yeah, I see. The, um, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because I was able to sit in on the first two webinars that you guys did. Um, and, you know, it's been so crazy uh, I wasn't able to really try and register for uh, the one yesterday, disadvantaged community, until maybe 15 minutes before. And I was not successful in getting on. When I went to your uh, to the website, um, there was no opportunity to even register. Um, so I, all I kept being sent to was to fill out a TA form, a technical assistance form. So if I already filled out an EPA technical assistance form, do I now have to fill out an Indina technical assistance form uh, so that I can have access to these webinars? I, I guess I'm a little confused. Andrea, do you know, it, it, it sounds as though we prompted whatever it is you filled out um, I know that you did fill Correct. out the equitable resilience technical assistance. It might it might be something that I could help you with. If you showed me what it is you did, then I could describe to you the other technical assistance that's available. 
It was the one that you guys sent out that I filled out, and I'm really still but waiting. That was for the response. equitable resilience. Okay, oh, so okay. different. That's okay, different but in the other technical assistance that yeah. Garrett heads up. But in the and meantime, I was when you guys sent out the email around the webinars. I filled out whatever had to be filled out in a day or two. They told me I can join the webinars, so I was able to uh, to actually sit in on the first two. Uh, the one yesterday, I wasn't able to. Now the first two was a wealth of information. I uh, thoroughly Thank enjoyed. You that no it, it was good it was good stuff and this is come coming from someone that read the 92 pages um so right. i would like to be able to continue to sit in on these and i'm not sure yeah. what the process is at this point in time sure come bring your friends everybody you got 100 we had 90 84 people please everybody join next week's webinar um I can't so register. if you come to yeah uh -huh. so if you come to the you come to the website and I, I don't know why you I, I wasn't obviously there next to you. I don't know what what the problem was yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. If you come to the website there, there is a drop down that says I think it's the webinars one or, or connect. Yeah. So there says webinars um, and there are two pages. One says past webinars and one says upcoming webinars. Um, mm -hmm. So if you go to the upcoming webinars page and just click, I believe it's an it's a, like a forward arrow um, that will yeah. take you straight to the yeah, that will take you straight to the Zoom um, registration, uh, and you can sign up right there. I actually, and I, 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 I signed up for the webinar uh, myself. I wasn't the presenter yesterday. I signed up for myself maybe twenty or thirty minutes before. Um, so uh, I, I don't know the technical problem that 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 you might have uh, encountered, um, but um, I think uh, we we are going to send an email blast tomorrow. Uh, talking okay. about next Tuesday's webinar, that that email blast is going to go out at, at roughly noon Eastern tomorrow. So anybody on this call, please you know go sign up for emails, sign up for newsletters, things like that, uh, okay. and you will get that email blast that has has the has the registration on it. Um, if none of this works, give us a call, drop us an email, um, and we can walk you through it. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I did send an email. I didn't get a response. Not yet, okay. anyway. I'm assuming I'll, so, I will. Want. So we will, like, as I said before, we will have um, yesterday's webinar up um, shortly. Uh, the word okay. that, care, that is carrying the most weight there is shortly, um, uh, which I know is nonspecific, but um, we're, we're, we're working as fast as we can. And sometimes technology is, 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 a, is a fun little beast, but we will have that up uh, shortly at very, at, and you can feel free to watch it. We're also um, looking to, to in, in the future, and this is weeks plural in the future, um, but to create uh, something that looks much more um, digestible than having to come watch an, an hour long webinar on a given topic or find something that is interesting to you. So, you know, three, four, five minute videos on specific topics that, that can be, you know, kind of like video on demand. Um, that is something that is still in the idea phase that uh, we're, we're trying to wrap our head around. Um, but uh, hopefully that's coming as well. Thank you. So we are four minutes past. I'm afraid I can't, we can't take any more questions. We're incredibly appreciative. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Garrett. And thank you, Abby. And, you know, this wonderful program and wonderful opportunity. And we look forward to all our members benefiting from it. So thank you. Lovely to see you all. And thank you, everyone. Again, come to okay, communitychangeta.org. Come to the website, sign up. We will help you any way we possibly can. I'll get that last minute plug in. Thank you for inviting us, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Can you send the PowerPoint, Garrett? Yes, I put it in the chat uh, earlier. So, but to okay. If you could email it to me as well, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Will Great. Do. I'll, I'll send mine as well. I'm so sorry we didn't hit the grant makers, but we can do another talk about that. There will be slides included and you can always forward any questions on to EPN. And A2. Thanks, guys. And A2. Take care. Okay. Ciao. Bye.